Great. When, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so my talk today is going to be about modeling of a superconducting squirrel, squirrel cage flux pump dynamo. And my name is Fernando Perez, and I work in the box superconductivity group in the University of Cambridge. And so the contents of this talk. So first, I'm going to give a brief introduction to what's a flux pump dynamo, because some people might not know. And then I'm going to give an operation example in a video based on a benchmark of this type of modeling problem that we have been working on. And then I'm gonna talk about how this model was set up in the case of what the results that I'm trying to reproduce. And then I'm gonna talk about how I set up the study very quickly. Then I'm gonna talk about the progress of this model and the results because it's something that I have been working uh, on and not all, not all the work is done yet. And then I'm gonna give the preliminary results that I have so far and then I'm going to give a conclusion. And so what's a flux pump dynamo in summary is a DC generator. You have an oscillating magnetic field and then introduce an electric field into the superconductor, usually a superconducting type because it has a, a high aspect ratio and then it's easier to introduce currents in it. And then you generate the voltage and you drive a small current. Then after several cycles, you can build up the currents enough to energize a superconducting coil, and this provides a reliable magnetizing system for machines. And then this means that if you have a system, you don't have to have a lot of power electronics to supply the coils. And it also means that you don't have a copper current leads or any kind of um, bulky leads that, because they tend to be very big. And then you should save a lot of energy because HTS coils, they require recharging. And so that's not very convenient when you want to have a high magnetic field machine. And so I'm gonna give this like to show how the flux pump works. So basically you have two main types of flux pumps. So one is that you have switches and then you interrupt a current and then you allow the current to pass intermittently and then you build up a current and these switches, they can be mechanical or they can be thermal switches. And then the other, the other way is that you have an oscillating magnetic field, which is the example that I gave in the introduction. And then in the case of the flux pump of this type of device, you have a rotor that has a magnet and then the, the magnet swipes a superconducting tape and this induces a voltage. Uh, and the equation is here. Um, where L is the length of the active, the active level of the magnet, and then S is the area, the cross area of the tape. And so this example that I'm providing is, as I said, from the benchmark model, and then is based on some uh, experiment that people from the Robinson Research Group Institute from the Victoria University of Wellington has have done, and some of the results are published in the reference that I'm providing here. And so then we did a benchmark that tries to reproduce these results with different approaches. And I'm gonna show a video based on this to, to, for people to see how the flux pump uh, is in operation. And so here are all the parameters in the left. And then I will show you the video. Here. So on the bottom to the left, I have the magnetic field distribution and then the magnet is gonna start rotating. And on the top to the left, I have the video of the flux pump as it would look. And then it will also rotate and it will show when it passes over the tape, which here in the bottom to the left, you can see a very thin line and that's the tape. And then you will see a voltage being induced and then you will see to the right a uh, small uh, 40 milliseconds interval so that you can zoom in and see how the voltage looks. And then when you have, when you're operating the machine, that voltage starts to get accumulated. And then that's the voltage that you would uh, use during operation. So yeah, so that starts to rotate then it passes over the tape and then you induce some voltage and then the voltage starts to build up. Then it will rotate again. And then it induces more voltage. Then it 
it just keeps going for a little bit. And eventually, as you have more and more rotations, then you start to approach steady state operation and the fluctuations in the build-up voltage vary less and less. So I'm going to stop it there. I'm just going to continue because it's basically the same repeating. And then I don't think it's very exciting after a little bit. Uh, OK, so the problem that I'm trying to solve is the squirrels um, cache uh, dynamo. And then in this configuration, you have a, a rotor that has different amount of magnets. And then you have different superconducting tapes that are arranged in the stator and then they form a squirrel cage as I guess in a similar to an induction machine but instead of having the rotor with the squirrel cage you have it in the stator and so then I'm trying to reproduce experimental um, electrical characterization of this machine and basically you have an open circuit voltage and a short circuit current um, course and then I'm trying to reproduce those characteristics the reference for this publication is in the bottom. And then the Ken Hamilton provided me with the CAD model of the machine so that I could take the measurements of the machine and see um, how I can simplify, sorry, the fire alarm test. And so I'm just trying to, I try to simplify the model and to reproduce that with finite element method in a commercial software console. And so then these are the expected results that I'm trying to achieve. And you can see that you have some voltage that is being created. And then as you increase the number of magnets, you increase the voltage. But after some point, if you increase the magnets too much because the frequency also increases too much, then the, the voltage and the current go down. And so then I set up my geometry. I simplify it in this way. And I thought that I didn't need the flat edges around the circle because, uh, because there is a, man a magnetic circuit in here with iron. Then it's basically going to insulate the machine. And I don't think that it's necessary to like have some agreement. And so then these are in the left, in the table, you can see the parameters of the geometry. And so you have a rotor in a radius of 27 millimeter, a rotor radius of 39.7, and air domain outer radius of 42.12, which is the air gap between the rotor and the stator. Then you have an iron shell or a stator that has a magnetic circuit with iron, and that's 57.5 in radius. And then you have the superconductor tape which is, uh, so the squirrel cage is for my eight super power SCS12050, and they're connected in parallel via bus rings. And then they have a tape length of 12 millimeters and a thickness of 0.1 millimeter. That, that's including all the layers of the tape. And then you have a magnet, and then the length is 6.35 millimeters. The width is 12.7 millimeters and the magnet that is 25.4 millimeters. And so then um, here you can see uh, the tapes that are pointed in the geometry. I put some red arrows because they are very thin compared with the rest of the geometry and you wouldn't be able to see them otherwise. And so I painted in gray the stator shell and the rotor yoke. And then the magnet is in orange and air domain is in like blue or teal. And so how the model is set up, it's, uh, so I use Maxwell's equation, obviously, and I'm using two formulations with console default physics. Uh, I'm solving the H formulation for the superconductor, and that's in console the MFH. 
and I'm using the vector magnetic uh, potential for everything else and in console that's RMF. And so then here you can see in red the areas that have the superconductor, so it's just the tape and it's very thin. Then you have the A formulation for everything else. And I'm not showing uh, all the geometry. I'm just showing like small sections so that you can see the tapes. And then, so for the H formulation, you're solving Faraday's law. And then to solve for the behavior of the superconductor, we are using the EG power law and we are solving in terms of the resistivity and with an M value of 21. And then the JC is, it has the magnetic field dependence and the theta dependence, depending on the angle of the field. And then we obtained this data of the tape from the web page of the Robinson Group. And then here's their web page. And then we calculated the, so because we only had some of the measurements of the angles and we had to complete them. Uh, assuming that there is like symmetric behavior in the tape. And then we calculated the dependence based on this technique that Victor Sermeño did in this publication. And then we had to recalculate uh, based on the X and Y components because the model is 2D and that's how it's set up in Cartesian coordinates in COMSOL. So then we applied that. And then the model uh, for the H formulation uh, it's of the vector potential, and here are the equations. And then the magnetization of the tape, we define it as 1.25 Tesla divided by naught. And the iron uh, is defined using a relative permeability of 4,000 and an electrical conductivity of 100 Siemens over meter. And then the model has to be divided into parts, one that is stationary and one that is rotating, and then in console, you can use the default moving mesh to do that. And what it does is that it applies a rotational transformation, uh, which is kind of like basic uh, algebra. And here is the equations for that. And then you need to put the deformation because otherwise it doesn't give you the correct results. And then, then you have to have a rotating contact to uh, provide the solution from the rotational part to the moving, to the stationary part. And so then we have to couple the two formulations. And for that, we set Newman boundary conditions. And for the part that goes from A to H, um, the equation is here. And then for the part, and so you need to provide the electric field from A to H. And for the part that goes from A to, from H to A, you provide the magnetic field. And so that's, that's it, that's it's quite easy. And then you have to set the model constraints and the model constraints that we use for the open voltage case, it's used the summatory of the integral of the currents in each of the tapes, they, it has to be equal to zero. And the individual um, integral of each tape has to be equal to zero too, because we're assuming that there is no transport current occurring in the machine because it's isolated. And then in the short circuit case, uh, then we add the, a term for the current of the charge circuit and it should be equal all the tapes and the charge circuit current. And so then how I set up the problem. So I have six configurations and then I have to calculate because I'm trying to reproduce the curves. Then I calculated all these speeds, uh, 250, 500, 700, 1000, 1500, 1000 and 3000 revolutions per minute. And then I wanted to make the models equivalent or the studies. So I decided to have 500 steps for each of the magnets and I multiplied that times the period and that gave me the time step for all the studies. And then to calculate the total time of the study, I just uh, solved the revolutions divided by the frequency. And then the tolerances that I set for the studies, it's uh, one e to the minus four relative tolerance and one e to the minus two for absolute tolerance. And then this is the progress that I have currently of this research. So I have run 42 simulations and that's, that basically gives me information for all the open voltage cases. And all of these models I did in full 2D because some of the 
models are not symmetric and I didn't think that it was correct to compare because there might be like slight differences if I use a symmetry and in those cases it's not pos in the cases that are not symmetric it's not possible to use symmetry to solve them so then it takes quite a bit of time and then the short circuit cases I will try to compute them soon because I need to work out some differences that I have with the experimental results and I'm trying to work out what would be affecting the most and Obviously, if you don't have steady state operation, you cannot calculate the short circuit current. And so then these are the results. I'm just showing here the cumulative voltage that you have for each of these speeds. And as you can see, there are variations in the voltage depending on the tape because they are not seeing the magnet at the same time, the tapes when you have just one magnet. And then this is for 3000 revolutions per minute. And then you can see the average cumulative voltage. So you just, you just average all the voltages from all the tapes. And then you get these curves. And then I decided to compare by cycle because then you can judge whether you have a rich steady state operation. Then you do the same when you have two magnets. And then you can see that some of the tapes are slightly offset from the other tapes in terms of the voltage. And that could mean that there is less current circulating through them or maybe more depending on, on the speed and the frequency. And obviously because it's FEM, like there might be slight variations or errors and that might affect the results. And so then for 3000 revolutions per minute, and then I have the two magnet case, the cumulative voltage, and then you can start to see that with five cycles, you don't seem to start approaching the steady state operation because the voltage starts to go up. And then with three magnets, and then you start to see that the voltages start to converge on all the tapes. They start to become basically the same. And so then you have again the cumulative voltage from all the tapes. And then you start to see that you start to get farther away from the steady state operation. But it also means that the voltage goes down as the frequency goes up. Then the four magnet case. And then you have the cumulative voltage. And you see that the same behavior repeats again. And you are farther from where you would want to be. And the five magnet case. And then you start to see the same. And then the eight magnet case. And so then you start to see that the voltages um, from all the tapes, well, as you increase the frequency, they tend to go to the lowest value of frequency. And it seems that at that point, you kind of have the steady state um, operation, but it also seems to be going to zero, which kind of would make sense because if you have a machine that it's completely symmetric, when the voltage, when the magnet passes over the tape, the one tape the current is going on one direction and in the other opposing tape, the current is going to be on the opposite direction. So then the, the overall like electric field is gonna cancel out. And so here are the curves that I calculated. So on the left, you have the experimental results and on the right, you have the simulation ones. And you can see that there is some qualitative and quantitative agreement in the first two cases with the one magnet and two magnet configuration. But as you start to go up in frequency, then the disagreement um, increases. And so I decided to check how I can improve the results because obviously I'm not in the state of operation and the discrepancy is too much. And so I thought maybe I can curve fit with the model and or I can use symmetry to solve for a higher amount of periods. Uh, 
but then obviously, like I can only do so when you have a high magnet town. So I was trying to test whether this helps. Uh, so I tried to recalculate and then I, I can kind of confirm that in the high magnet case, then the current or the voltage this starts to go towards zero, which might mean that having like a number of magnets that is uh, even is not a good idea, uh, but it also like disagrees too much with the experimental results. So I'm not really sure whether that's correct. So it might be that there is something in the constraints that is not correct, but I would figure out as I go. And so then the conclusions that I can give so far. So the solution for each configuration and speed, uh, and all these combinations, they take a lot of time to compute. So just for five cycles. So in our current computer server that we are using, this takes between 12 hours and 24 hours. Uh, and this depends on the frequency and the magnet count. And so this means that it might be a little bit inconvenient to try to use FEM for this, but maybe there are, there are other things to consider. And maybe we can use some tricks like using pure cycles and then fit some curve and try to predict the behavior in the long term, which might be beneficial, or it might be also possible to apply symmetry and have better prediction and calculate just higher cycles. And all of this is obviously provided that the frequency dependence and the different layers that the tape has are not the ones providing dominant effects in the higher frequencies, because it might be that the current is just changing from the superconductor into the copper and so on. And so this, if you have any questions and that's it from me. Thank you very much, Fernando. Yep. Um,